This month on The Training Show, we're going to spend a day with Lead Thurston County. We're going to rock out at the Native Coastal Jam. We're going to examine shoreline degradation at the Port of Olympia. Plus, we're going to check out how mathematics can be applied to art. All this and more on the TCTV Training Show, coming up next. It's the TCTV Training Show. The TCTV Training Show. They're learning how to shoot and learning how to light. Learning how to mic and edit right. These are TCTV's finest in training. Doing their best with focusing and framing. It's the TCTV Training Show. The TCTV Training Show. You're watching TCTV. It's the Training Show. The TCTV Training Show. They will get better. Thanks for tuning in to the TCTV Training Show. I'm Peter Goodmanson, and I'm the student intern here at Thurston Community Television. The TCTV Training Show is composed of three to four minute video clips made by students in the TCTV Digital Field and Editing class. And we've got a great show for you today, so let's get right to it. Our first piece is by Kim Marillo, who talks about Lead Thurston County. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Betsy Pazanger. I'm the program director for Lead Thurston County. Lead Thurston County is your local leadership development program. Uh, we are a program of the Thurston County Chamber Foundation. Lead Thurston County is a 10-month leadership development program. Starts in September every year, runs through June. And today, what you're going to see is a little bit of our Health and Human Services program day. Hi, my name is Susan Barbeau. I was a Lead Thurston County participant last year in 2007. This year I am part of the curriculum committee to design the days. Um, last year, one of the great days that we had was Health and Human Services Day that I found really interesting. Uh, I am work in retirement, um, doing financial um, retirement and planning for people. And so I created a game um, which was based off of statistics for a population of over 65. Um, as far as how long their retirement savings is going to last them, things that they'll have to pay for, such as long-term care. We are doing, at this moment, a little bit of yoga because stretching and exercise are a part of our health, our overall health, for our well-being. Kari from the Valley has come to help us explore that side and to relieve some of the tension that we've built up even through this fun day. It's early afternoon and we just need to stretch a little bit. So that's what we're doing right now. One of the great things about this program um, is that you really get to get involved in what's going on in the community and the way that they do that is through the challenge days. Um, so during um, my time last year in 2007, um, well, how it works is they break out the days that you're involved with um, and for example Health and Human Services Day is one day and so that day is um, completely dedicated to just Health and Human Services um, and how Health and Human Services affects our community and what organizations are available and whatnot um, and so it's a full day um, 8 to 5 full of lots of information and resources um, that you learn and discover um, about our community. Show. Kim, this was a great piece. I liked how it started. Your interviewees introduced themselves and you cut straight to some b-roll while they were talking. One thing I noticed is that behind the interviewees there was a shadow on the wall and this can be solved by simply moving the people who are talking a bit farther away from the wall so that your light source doesn't cast their shadow on the wall. I noticed that the titles were a little cut off. When you're working with Final Cut Express HD you have to make sure that your titles are inside the title safe box in the canvas. This makes sure that you can see them on every TV when it's played back. Um, I'm not sure if you meant to put a keyframe to move the last part of the titles, but it seemed a little strange to me. At times I noticed the sound cutting in and out, but 
In the future, what you can do is use audio crossfades in order to uh, fade up from silence. Or even better, you can put some faint music in the background to kind of mask when there's no sound at all, when you just want to show video. And, uh, you know, music isn't always necessary, but it's, it's kind of helpful, especially since it'll set the mood as well. I also noticed at one point you cut to a different part in the same scene without using any B-roll. And this is a little distracting as well. Um, you can either use a crossfade to mask this or like a clock wipe to simulate time passing. But basically, you should just generally use B-roll, uh, just supplemental footage to put over the interviewer when she's talking. And it's good practice to edit stuff like this. Our next piece is by Maria Beltre, who traveled to the native coastal jam to get some footage. Let's take a look. Hello, my name is Terry Kapoman. I'm a Squaxin Island member. I'm Gloria Hill, Squaxin Island tribal member. Today is February 15th, 2008. And as you can hear behind me, there are drummers from different tribes at a coastal jam here at Squaxin Island Event Center. It brings different tribes together for a purpose to get together instead of for funerals or in mourning. And we have different tribes like Suquamish, Port Gamble, Puyallup, Nisqually, Muckleshoot, Grand Ron, Hell River, Quileute, Macaw, Cowlitz, Suquamish, Squaxin Island, and um, so there's quite a few of us here tonight. We all like getting together and having a jam session. We've been getting together at least once a week for the last six months. For the last six months, it's been happening at least once a week. And the, so far, this has been the biggest one yet, the biggest jam. And I, it makes my heart warm to notice that all our family members from other tribes like coming here and being with us know that they're going to have good food and a good time. It's really cool watching the young people out there dancing and just having a really good time. That, that's what really warms my heart and seeing our elders come together and keeping our tradition and our culture going and keep teaching it to our young people. Maria, this was a really interesting look into the tribal cultures around the Northwest. You used B-roll really well to supplement the speakers talking, but one thing I would mention is that you might want to get them to take off their hats next time because both of their faces were in shadow the entire time. If they absolutely had to keep their hats on, then I would suggest lighting them from below just to illuminate their faces a bit more because that's uh, one of the most important things about doing an interview. From the start, the volume was kind of loud, so I turned down my TV, but then when the speakers started talking, they were a little bit quiet, and at the very end during your credits, the drums got really, really loud. So one of the big things I would say for you is to normalize your audio before you print it to video, and by that I mean just make sure that your audio is pretty much all of the same level so that the person doesn't have to continually adjust the volume. When you're editing, you want to keep your, your audio somewhere in the negative 6 to negative 12 decibel range um, right when the little meter starts getting yellow if you get over that if your volume is too loud then it'll start peaking and you'll see a little red dot appear on the audio meters and that means that you're gonna get some distortion I noticed the drums at the end were only on the right channel and this was a little bit odd because the drums at the beginning and the voices in during the the interviews were all in mono and it might have been a stylistic choice by you, but just make sure that when you're editing and you turn your audio envelopes on that you don't have the pan shifted anywhere in particular, unless you specifically mean to. Our next piece comes from Patricia Di Francesca, and we're going to head over to the Port of Olympia and talk about what's going on over there.
While what we have here is uh, is the estuary of the Deschutes River. Uh, an estuary is a place where fresh water coming uh, downstream meets the marine environment. And it's an active system where a lot of things are taking place. Nutrients uh, coming downstream are normally uh, consumed by algae and phytoplankton. And algae and phytoplankton are in turn consumed by herbivores, which are in, in turn consumed by larger fish. If all of this is happening in, uh, in tide flats that typically characterize an estuary, uh, you shouldn't have anoxic conditions occurring. You should instead have uh, primary production and the initiation of the food web. Um, coincidentally, uh, chemicals coming downstream are remediated in the, the uh, presence of abundant sunlight and oxygen that you have in shallow tide flats. So if everything is ha happening on shallow tide flats, things will happen right. When you run an estuary through a long pipe and then into a dredged bay, nothing happens right. And uh, unfortunately, that's what characterizes most of the stream estuaries in Puget Sound and some of the ri river estuaries, uh, that you have a, a dredged bay. Uh, where conditions do become anoxic. You have more bacteria and other things uh, consuming nutrients and rather than um, having a, a at healthy East food Bay, web, we have, have uh, Moxley and would Indian be more, creeks uh, are running through about a mile of pipe and then life they, in a septic they dump tank. into uh, a dredged bay. So conditions in East Bay are particularly anoxic. Um, ideally, some of these tide flats would be restored and uh, and water quality would improve. Uh, additionally, all along the shore, you have near, near shore environments uh, along the high tide mark where you would have typically salt marsh plants or overhanging vegetation. Um, salt marsh, in addition to being a highly productive uh, area of food production, uh, once again, contaminants can be remediated there. And unfortunately, we can see this, the port doesn't believe in salt marsh restoration or, or any kind of uh, natural nearshore. They engage in a lot of artificial landscaping, which really provides no benefit for the marine environment at all. And uh, we could, in fact, have salt marsh along here. It could be, it could be done naturally and not impede development. They, they just simply have an aversion to doing things naturally. This right here is, the, is what would be the near shore. This area between the high tide mark and the shore is, uh, is where we would like to see salt marsh and over, overhanging vegetation instead of these uh, these grasses that aren't even native, whatever else they've done in here. This was a really interesting piece to learn about how the port has impacted nature. There were a couple minor audio problems throughout the piece, such as a static here and there, and one time I think I heard voices overlap, but I'm sure that was you know, just, a, just an editing mistake, and that thing can be easily corrected. So your video was a little bit longer than some of the other ones, and that's okay, but your shot stayed on the speaker for quite a long time, and uh, you might want to put in some other B-roll just to give the viewers something else to look at. A lot of the video was shot during an overcast day, which I thought was a really cool stylistic choice, even if it was unintentional, because it kind of set the tone for this evil port moving in and doing all this stuff to the water. And you even showed the speaker standing behind a fence that said, danger, keep out, with the cranes in the background and all that. 
and I thought that was, that was a really nice touch. I noticed at one point you panned away from the speaker to show the bushes and stuff in front of him. Um, and this, you know, wasn't a bad choice because he was talking about the artificial foliage and stuff. But in the future, you might want to just keep a dedicated camera on the speaker at all times and get your B-roll sometime else, you know, before or after the actual shoot, just so that you always have that master copy. Great job, good cinematography, and I really liked this one. So let's go on to Taisha and Hassan's project, talking about mathematics in art. Hello, welcome to our series on visionaries. I'm Taishia. And I'm Hassan. We are here today with Jeremy Kraft of Olympia, Washington. Jeremy is a student at the Evergreen State College where he is pursuing studies in photography and consciousness. Uh, he has used his artistic eye to create photographic montages which in Jeremy's words give the viewer an experiential opportunity for reflection. Jeremy, the artwork you create looks very abstract, yet you start with simple objects found in our daily life or nature. Can you describe your technique or workflow uh, by which you arrive to the final result? Sure. I begin, I uh, shoot with a medium format film camera. I shoot on color negative film. And I spend my time out in the sunlight, uh, constantly searching. Um, composing the shot as I'm there, uh, what you see in the final frame is about 80% composed in the frame, the original frame in my shot. I then take the negative and scan it into Photoshop, where it is um, taken in at a really high resolution and then built, the overall patterning is built in Photoshop and then my final color correcting and cropping and sizing is done there and then sent to printing. I think most people are familiar with the concept of unconscious archetypical symbols and Jeremy in your work I'm just wondering if you think that the elements of nature such as water and rocks and air and wind and trees are also archetypical um, in a language sense that kind of comes into play in your montages. Yes, for sure. Um, I leave a lot of ambiguous space. Um, things are in focus or out of focus and it gives the viewer an opportunity to wander and kind of make free associations within the symmetries and a lot of times people see insects from twigs and they see frogs from water scenes and butterflies from leaves and I think that association is really easy to make because those those species um, their cam their natural camouflage comes from those environments so they're very similar however people always see eyes and faces and kind of fantastical yeah. human forms yeah. and I think this comes from sense that the human mind is so trained to see emotion and read emotion from the symmetry of the human face or for the survival. Human, yeah, for the human body or just communication in general. That they naturally grasp at this and see that in the forms. Jeremy, are there any other areas you would like to explore that combine computer technology uh, with nature? Sure. I I've always been intrigued by the 3D generation programs that create trees and landscapes, weather mm -hmm. patterns using fractal mathematics. I think it'd be fun to play with those and create fantastical worlds as well as um, just practical applications such as reforestation or revegetation plants for environmentally damaged areas. And I also am very interested in using digital video and playing with the sense of time within my work. Um, I've got another year left of school and I'm hoping to utilize that to explore those areas. Jeremy, I see fractals all over your photographs and I know that they are mathematical abbreviations of nature. Were you surprised when you went and developed this film to see fractals everywhere? 
Um, no, not necessarily. I had been studying patterning in nature for a while, and that led me to um, understanding in fractal mathematics and studying it a little bit. And my knowledge of that has grown alongside my, my work, and it's grown into my work, and it's just become part of my work. Jeremy, would you like to share your future plan with us? I'm currently working on a website and I'm going to be, I'm constantly shooting, so I hope to continue producing work and having, finding opportunities to show it. And I've got a year, a little over a year left of school, and we'll see what opportunities arise after that. Sounds great. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jeremy, for coming, and we wish you all the best success in your work at Evergreen. If you'd like to see some more of Jeremy's work, you can find it at myspace.com. And join us next time for further conversations with visionaries. Wow, this was a great video. For one, I liked a lot of the music choices that you had, and you had a lot of music. For every piece of art you showed on the screen, there was kind of a different audio to go along with it, and it kind of fit. They all seemed to be hand-picked, and they seemed to fit the mood perfectly. Um, but it was a little strange that the music cut off once the picture went off the screen, because you get used to that kind of background ambience, and all of a sudden just to have the interview's voices go or going again, it just sounded a little empty. So you might want to keep that music going while the interview is talking and then maybe fade into a new piece once the new piece of artwork pops up on the screen. Um, at times I noticed the music was just barely overwhelming. Next time you might want to make it a little bit quieter while they're speaking because you know some, some of their words were hard to make out, but it was, it was a pretty good volume. I would just say a little bit quieter. I noticed that the art on the screen were all in different aspects and sometimes they didn't fill the screen like there were black bars on either side of the art, but that's just a stylistic choice again. I noticed the cameras were moving around a lot during the interviews and this is alright, but in the future you might consider bringing two cameras to get two shots at once so you don't have to pan back and forth between like Taisha and Hassan and the artist on the couch. I really appreciated how you used public domain musical scores and an original piece by somebody in the area. This is really a great way of taking advantage of what's around you. you know, if you ever want to use music that's copyrighted, before it airs you have to get the necessary licenses and permissions from the artists or the record companies before you put it on the air. TCD Training Show. Whoa, look what time it is, how'd that happen? Well, thanks for tuning in to this month's episode of the TCTV Training Show. Don't forget to watch on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. and Sundays at 3.30, only on TCTV's own Channel 22. Now, if you would like to become a part of the TCTV Training Show, you must first become enrolled in the Digital Field and Editing class. So, navigate to tctv.net or call us at 956-3100 to find out when these classes are offered. Now, you must be a current member of TCTV and have taken the orientation before you can do this, so don't get any ideas. That's it for this month, so until next time, I'm Peter Goodmanson, signing off. It's the TCTV Training Show. The TCTV Training Show. Getting, getting permission, getting, getting a license, getting a license, I can't even talk. Okay, let's try this again. <clears throat> Take 20 billion. So don't change that dial. Remote, click. Here we go. Yes, it's recording right now. This is all making history. So. That's Dan.
Bye-bye, Ted. Bye-bye. They will get better.